The journey to the International Space Station is a dangerous adventure. This trip to space starts in the heart of Russia, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. It's here because, currently, the only way to send astronauts to the ISS is on a Russian Soyuz vessel nicknamed the Space Taxi. The trip to the ISS takes 48 hours. The astronauts are seated in this little module perched at a height of more than 40 meters high. Strapped into their seats ready for takeoff, it's thanks to this cabin called the descent module that the astronauts can also return to Earth. When the vessel arrives in orbit, the team can move into the orbital module. The size of a small truck, this is where they can relax. At the other end is the service module, which contains guidance systems, batteries, and motors for maneuvering. The team has to check the vessel's trajectory regularly and make adjustments if necessary. The trip takes them roughly 30 times around the Earth, the time it takes for the Soyuz to get into the same orbit as the ISS in order to dock with it. As it approaches the International Space Station, Soyuz turns to face the right way and slows down. Although it is automated, this approach is always tricky. If there's the slightest doubt or technical failure, the commanding officer must be able to take over to control the final approach. And it was during his first flight that British astronaut Tom Peake had to deal with an incident that could have had some dramatic consequences. Everything was going fine up until about 17 meters away from the space station. So that was fairly close. In fact, that's the closest abort that there's been. Uh, and then we had a, a sense of failure with one of our thrusters. The URI then had to take over manual control and complete a manual docking. It was just a question of docking. The safety of the station depended on it. The ISS isn't a uniform structure. It's made up of many parts that stick out. A collision would have been fatal, not just for the crew on the Soyuz, but for those on board as well. Piloting in space is much more complex than piloting on Earth because there are six elements to manage. On Earth, when you drive a car, you have two elements, steering right or left, and braking or accelerating. Up there in space, you are managing six different variables at the same time. You can go left, right, up, down, you can pivot, anything you like. It's an extremely complicated process. Transition to manual. A manual docking is certainly a, a difficult task to do. It was made uh, more complicated in our case because we were going from uh, daytime to nighttime and the low sun angle was reflecting uh, bright light off the space station. So Yuri was having a very hard time seeing through the periscope uh, in order to see the docking port and to get the spacecraft correctly aligned. Uh, it was very complicated, but in the end, I managed to get a distance from where I could see the docking area, control the speed, and get the angle right. Eventually, we managed to dock it successfully. Until those perilous maneuvers, the space station had never witnessed an accident. For some time now, private companies along with NASA have been developing new spacecraft to take astronauts to the International Space Station. The space workers are installing new docking modules. 
One of the big uh, steps, of course, uh, was the removal of a large thermal cover by Rubens and uh, Williams uh, to expose uh, the actual docking port to which the SpaceX Crew Dragon and the... The station currently has eight docking ports. In addition to the passenger craft, there is another kind of vessel that docks with the space station, supply vehicles. We have a lot of unmanned resupply vehicles that get sent up to, to the space station. We have Japanese resupply vehicles, we have Russian, we have American. Every three months, these vehicles supply the space station, delivering water, a few fresh products, clothes, tools, and experiments. Once emptied, these supply vehicles have another key function. They are used as the space station's trash can. Space station is a closed system. Everything that you bring up at some time needs to come down. So if you bring up uh, clothing, for example, for the crew, uh, we don't have a washing machine, so the crew has to wear the same pants. Uh, you get two pants for six months. You have to wear the same T-shirt for a week or for two weeks. Uh, and then when it's finally dirty and it's trashed, uh, all this trash is accumulated in the cargo vehicles. Come join me in the Progress vehicle, which is loaded and ready to leave. It's filled with bags of rubbish. I need to crouch right down because there's not much room. I'll try and show you. Everything is arranged symmetrically to balance out the vessel. Heavy things go opposite heavy things. You can see here, for example, there are purification columns, buckets that we've used, and even our dirty laundry, and little packages with our trash. The vessels filled with trash are then unmoored. They burn and disintegrate when they enter the Earth's atmosphere. But some of the supply vessels fulfill a last function that directly involves the ISS. They are used as motors because the station is unable to maintain the right orbit on its own. The idea is the ISS is about 220 to 250 miles above uh, the surface of Earth. Um, so you might think, well, so there's no air, so why would you ever need to speed up? It should just forever be in orbit. Well, where the ISS is, there's actually a very thin amount of atmosphere there. It's borderline negligible, but it is still there. So we have basically this giant football field. I mean, a vehicle that has a football field flying through space, it's getting a lot of air. There's a lot of surface area that's getting hit by the small amount of air that's in the atmosphere. Uh, so that does slowly slow the ISS down. And so the, the ISS altitude is de decaying by about two kilometers per month. And if it were to have no reboosts, then eventually the space station would re-enter Earth's atmosphere. Every six months, a supply vessel is used to readjust the orbit of the ISS. The vessel starts its motors and emits bursts of power to get the station moving to the right altitude. The thrust can be felt inside the station itself. Now, the way I'm going to demonstrate the acceleration that comes during the reboost is by using this camera. Uh, 800 millimeter land, so it's, it's pretty massive, actually. And there's no accelerations, virtually no accelerations on us. And you can see I'm floating this camera right here, and it's not going anywhere. And I'm holding it, I'm actually feeling the acceleration. I'm gonna let go again, and here it goes, it's gonna take off. I'll try not to let it hit you. But it's not only the height of the orbit that needs to be regulated. They also have to keep the space station angled the right way. So the space station maintains um, what we call LVLH, local vertical, local horizon. And that means that the space station flies around the Earth, always Earth facing. The station's steering system is based on four gyroscopes. Without them traveling at 28,000 kilometers an hour, the ISS would turn endlessly on itself, and life inside would be simply impossible. In zero gravity, if you knock it, it's going to tumble, it's going to move around um, like any object up here does. However, if I get this uh, spinning...
So once the gyroscope is sp spinning, you can just see how stable it becomes. And however I knock it, it's not going to change its plane. It's going to remain in the same plane. The gyroscopes turn like a spinning top or bicycle wheel to ensure stability. But the rotation axis of the gyroscopes is also controlled, allowing the station to tilt to follow the curve of the Earth. By maintaining this LVLH, it means that we have a great Earth observation platform. That's why our cupola window is always looking at, at planet Earth.